Hi, welcome to a short series of presentations on vaccines and vaccinations. First presentation is vaccines in five minutes or less. And I'm Randy Horwitz from the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine at the University of Arizona. Here to guide you through this. To start, I'm going to discuss five types of vaccines. And no, these are not based on how how badly they, they hurt when you receive the vaccine. Rather, they're going to be based on the composition of the vaccines. And before we start, I just want to preface everything by saying I believe that vaccinations represent one of the best uses of the healthcare dollar that we have. So let's start with whole virus vaccines, and I'm going to subdivide this into two categories. The first is live attenuated vaccines. And you can see in the figure, as I describe, we take a virus, we grow it up, uh, we lessen its pathogenicity in the lab, either by serially passaging it in vitro through many, many generations, or through animals serially. And what this does is lessens pathogenicity. We develop strains that are less harmful and kind of mimics natural infections in many cases where pathogenicity will eventually decline. Uh, the advantage of having a whole live attenuated virus as a, a vaccine is that the virus replicates and persists a lot longer than a dead virus would a dead vaccine. So you're getting more bang for the buck with your injection because the virus will divide and you'll get many division cycles. So it'll persist a bit longer. Disadvantage, you could get reversion to a more pathogenic form. And we've seen this with the oral polio vaccine, where oral polio uh, goes from a harmless to a more harmful form. And actually, a few kids have gotten polio from the oral polio, which is why in the U.S. we have not used an oral polio vaccine since the year 2000. MMR, rotavirus, another example of live attenuated vaccines. Now, the other type of whole virus vaccine is an inactivated or dead virus vaccine. This is where we kill the virus in vitro with heat or chemicals and inject a bunch of dead virus, either with or without an adjuvant, which is a chemical added to increase immunogenicity reactivity in the immune system. Now, the advantage of a whole virus dead vaccine is no chance of infection. Everything's dead that you're injecting. And there's many surface antigens present in their native conformation. So you have, you have a shell with all the proteins intact. Now the disadvantage is it doesn't last as long as a live virus. So it may require multiple doses or you may need a booster. An example of this is the um, polio vaccine that we use, the IPV, or the Hep A vaccine, or even the rabies vaccine. The protein subunit vaccine, which is the third type we're talking about, this is where we grow up the virus, we isolate and purify the antigenic or immunogenic proteins that are on the surface of the virus, and we inject these either alone or with an adjuvant. So in the case of COVID, perhaps you take a whole slew of spike protein, purify it, and, and inject that. The advantage, again, is there's no chance of infection from just the proteins, and secondly, we can we can just concentrate the heck out of it, put a lot of spike protein in that injection. Now the disadvantage is again, the protein has a set half-life, so it may require multiple doses or a booster to get more immunogenicity. Examples of a protein subunit vaccine would be pertussis or hep B or HPV. Coming near the end, this is nucleic acid. These are newer approaches. This is DNA or RNA. So here, if we we're talking about COVID, we would take the RNA, the messenger RNA, or DNA that codes for spike protein, for example, and we would inject that. And we'd have to encase it probably in a little lipid coat or a shell to help it into the cells, or maybe use an electric current electroporation technique. But we'd want to get this naked nucleic acid into the cells. It's not infectious, so we have to artificially get it taken up by cells. Now, the viral proteins that the DNA or RNA code for, the particular genes that we use in the vaccine, would then uh, be used to 
make the protein using the cell's machinery. So basically, we're putting in a foreign blueprint into the cell and having it make protein as if it's its own. The advantage, really quick to make. I mean, as soon as they sequenced the coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, they were able to uh, artificially synthesize the nucleic acid. So it's cheap, it's easy to purify, we can make a lot of it. But the disadvantages, it's unproven. We've never done this before on a large scale. It's been done in animals and I think in veterinary practices as well, but not in humans. Also, we need to get the DNA or RNA into the cell. These nucleic acids aren't that stable in solution, so we, find, we need to find a way to get it in quickly. And finally, do we know the long-term effects of a nucleic acid uh, a vaccination? No, we have nothing to base our claims on other than experimentally. So there are no examples of a DNA or RNA uh, vaccination in humans right now. Finally, a uh, viral vector. And here we're going to take a harmless virus, either a measles virus or adeno. Let's take adenovirus, which is a common cold virus. And we're going to take that as a delivery agent to deliver the blueprint to make CoV-2 proteins. So instead of just finding a lipid shell or just injecting a nucleic acid into the arm, for example, we are going to inject a virus which contains that particular blueprint or gene for, say, spike protein. So the virus can replicate. The advantage the virus can replicate in the cell and keep churning out antigen. There's no risk of infection because... Uh, the virus that we're using is uh, rather harmless. Um, the disadvantage is it may require several doses to get adequate uh, infection of your own cells. And the other disadvantage is you may have immunity to the vector. So if you've had, there's a lot of forms and variants of adeno, and if you've been infected by that particular adenovirus that we're using as a viral vector, then you may rapidly get rid of it so it won't be a very effective vaccine. This vaccine has been used with Ebola successfully, so we do have precedent for this. I went a little over five minutes, but coming up next in our next presentation, we will give an overview of the COVID vaccines that are available now. See you soon.